taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Ivan Milat. The Backpacker Murderer. On the 27th of December, 1944, Ivan Robert Marko Milat, was born into an extended Yugoslavian immigrant family into Australia, he was one of a massive 14 children. The family life for the Milat children growing up, was rural and insular, and the children tended to keep to themselves, thus making reliable information about Ivan Milat's upbringing difficult to obtain. His brother, Boris, would tell interviewers after Ivan's trial, that he had shown behavioral issues from a young age, though this has been disputed by other family members. Growing up, Milad was described as a good-looking lad with well-defined muscles and a passion for hunting. He also had quite a fascination for guns. His parents kept their troop of 14 in line by encouraging them to be hard-working, and ruling with an authoritarian sense of discipline. When the Milad boys were growing up however, the home discipline wasn't enough, they gained a reputation for lawlessness and petty crime. Due to this, the family were visited by police on numerous occasions, including many times for Ivan. From the age of 17 onwards, Milad was constantly in trouble with both the police and the courts, on various charges that included, housebreaking, car thefts, and even armed robberies. In 1971, Ivan Milat was charged and put on trial for the alleged rape of two female hitchhikers. During the supposed attack, Milat was accused of using a knife to intimidate the pair, though he would eventually be acquitted of all charges. Due to the remoteness of the Australian outback, there is tremendous speculation over how many victims Ivan Milat has claimed. One person who was a victim, but who also luckily survived, is Paul Onions. Onions was hitchhiking south from Sydney in search of work, and was picked up by Ivan Milat on the 25th of January, 1990. According to Onions, Milat was initially very friendly towards him, introducing himself as Bill, but he soon found Milat's personal questions about his travel plans unnerving and became increasingly concerned for his safety. When Milat began making racist and xenophobic remarks however, Onions decided enough was enough, and when Milat pulled his car to the side of the road, the hitchhiker tried to make his exit. Ivan Milat had other ideas however, and he pulled out a revolver and told Onions to put on his seatbelt. In that instant, Onions managed to bolt for safety, leaving behind his backpack which contained all of his current possessions. Onions then managed to flag down a passing car, which took him to the nearest police station so that he could report the incident. He returned to Sydney to replace the missing passport, not yet aware of just how lucky he had been in his narrow escape. The first of Milat's less fortunate victims to be discovered, were British backpackers, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. They were found by orienteers on the 19th of September. 1992, in an area of the Belongolo State Forest, known locally as Executioner's Drop. This was fairly close to the area where the attack on Paul Onions had occurred in 1990, though the attacks weren't linked due to the differences in their nature. Both of the women had been missing since May of that year, when they had teamed up to look for work south of Sydney and the attacks on them appeared to be prolonged and brutal. Joanne Walters had been repeatedly stabbed, including one wound to her spine that possibly paralyzed her while the killer continued his vicious attack. The zip of her jeans had been undone, but the top button was still fastened, as if she had been partially stripped and sexually assaulted, then rebuttoned after the attack. This was probably to disguise a sexual motive. Her remains were too badly decomposed to actually establish whether a sexual assault had occurred. Carolyn Clark had also been stabbed repeatedly, though she had also been shot in the head ten times. One thing in particular that stood out to examiners, was that she also had a paralyzing knife wound akin to Joanne's. Four bullets that remained inside her skull were preserved for forensic analysis and detectives were confident that they would be able to use these to track the weapon responsible. 
in the area close to the bodies, a primitive brick fireplace had been constructed, which had cigarette butts and spent .22 caliber cartridge cases nearby. An extensive search of the surrounding area produced no more bodies at that time, and the possibility that a serial killer was on the loose, although speculated in the press, was denied by the police authorities. Despite the abundance of forensic evidence, police made little progress over the following weeks and sought the assistance of a forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Rod Milton. He concluded that the killer was in his mid-thirties, with a history of aggression, was familiar with the surrounding terrain, and was motivated by the pleasure of inflicting pain. Furthermore, he did not believe that a serial killer was responsible, although it was possible that the killer might have an assistant. After the initial investigation, progress began to slow as leads dried up, even though there was a thorough investigation of all suspicious disappearances over the previous decade. In October of 1993, the discovery of a second set of bodies injected new life into the case. The badly decomposed remains were those of Australian nationals James Gibson, and Deborah Everest, who had gone missing in 1989. Despite the environmental damage that had affected the scene and the victim's clothing, Gibson's zipper was intact, it was open, but with a top button fastened in a similar manner to Joanne Walters. This would provide a link between the two crimes, and post-mortem examinations again revealed horrific paralyzing spinal knife wounds. A sinister, but conclusive link between the two sets of murders. Further similarities prevailed throughout the crime scene. These included another small fireplace built near the bodies, making the police more certain that they were dealing with the same killer. A large task force was then set up to bring impetus to the investigations, and a massive search of the extended Belongolo forest area was initiated. Within a month, another victim was found. On the 1st of November, German national Simone Schmidl's body was discovered, she had been missing since January of 1991, when she had been planning to hitchhike south from Sydney in search of work. She had also suffered the now familiar debilitating spinal injury that had been inflicted on the previous victims. The trademark fireplace and discarded .22 shells were also close by, leaving no doubt that she had fallen victim to the same killer. Another two victims were discovered just three days later, as the extensive search continued its pace. These would be the last bodies found. German nationals on Jehabskide and her boyfriend Gabor Neugebauer, had been missing since just after Christmas in 1991. Gabor's jeans had been unzipped, but with the button fastened, and he had been strangled as well as shot numerous times. The recovered bullets were a perfect match to previous crime scenes. Anja's body was missing its skull completely, which appeared to have been severed by a machete or sword leaving the possibility that her assailant took it as a trophy. With the discovery of the numerous new bodies, police were forced to admit to the media that they were looking for a serial killer. The wide range of methods employed by the killer, including beating, strangulation, shooting, stabbing, and decapitation, as well as the sexual assault of both male and female victims made it difficult to narrow down the suspect list. Police were also hampered by the sheer volume of calls from concerned citizens, who swamped the task force with miscellaneous information. The police investigating the case soon began to develop suspicions about the Millat family, and in particular, Ivan. But there was no firm evidence linking him to the crimes. Not without a brick coming their way anyway. The international media interest reached the UK, and Paul Onions, the only one of Milad's victims to escape, contacted Australian authorities in April of 1994. This was in regards to information about his 1990 attack, he felt that it was relevant. His account was further corroborated, by an independent call from the woman who had rescued Onions and driven him to the police station, and police recognized quickly that, if Onions could identify Ivan Milat as his attacker, 
then they could perhaps tie him into the other murders. Paul Onions was flown out to Australia, where he identified Milat from a video lineup, giving police the evidence they needed to seek a warrant for the search of various Milat family properties. A simultaneous raid was carried out in the early hours of the 22nd of May, 1994, which revealed a huge amount of evidence linking Milat to the crimes. This included personal effects of many of the victims, including clothing, sleeping bags, and other camping equipment, as well as vast quantities of ammunition. They also found parts of disassembled weapons, including a .22 caliber rifle. A long curved cavalry sword, suitable for the beheading of Anja Habskide, was found in a locked cupboard at the home of Milat's mother. Ivan Milad was then arrested and taken into custody for questioning, where he was evasive and uncooperative. He was initially charged with the attack on Paul Onions, then subsequently with the seven murders, after ballistic evidence matched his weapon to the attacks. He was remanded in custody to await trial. When Milad's lawyer advised him to plead guilty, he fired him instantly. In March of 1996, Ivan Milad was brought before the court on seven counts of murder, as well as the attack on Paul Onions. He pleaded not guilty to all charges. The first prosecution witness was Paul Onions, who was followed by testimony from the family members of the victims. Next were the details of the hundreds of exhibits and scene of crime photos, as well as expert witness testimony. The prosecution case took 12 whole weeks to present. The defense then called the man in question, Ivan Milat to the stand, he denied any involvement in the killings, though he performed poorly under cross-examination and made a poor impression on the jury. The defense then attempted to imply that other members of the Milat family had committed the crimes, and that they had set Ivan Milat up, but the case that was presented was not credible. On the 27th of July, 1996, following a 15-week trial, the jury returned after three days of consideration, finding Ivan Robert Marco Milat, guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to six years imprisonment for the attack on Paul Onions, and seven consecutive life sentences for each of the murders. When asked if he had any comment, Ivan Milat continued to protest his innocence. Milad was incarcerated in the maximum security wing of Goulburn Prison, near Sydney. Milad has always maintained his innocence, and later staged self-mutilation attacks, and hunger strikes, in a bid to get his appeals heard. In May of 1997, authorities foiled a well-planned jailbreak attempt masterminded by Milad. His accomplice was found hanged in his cell the next morning. Then in July of 2001, his initial appeal against his sentence was denied. Police maintain that Ivan Milat may have been involved in many more murders than the seven of which he was convicted. In the summer of 2001, Milat was ordered to give evidence at an inquest into the disappearances of three other female backpackers, but no case has been brought against him, due to lack of evidence. Similar inquiries were launched in 2003, in relation to the disappearance of two nurses and again in 2005, relating to the disappearance of Hitchhiker and Nepriffa, but no charges have resulted. On 8 November, 2004, Ivan Milat gave a televised interview, in which he denied that any of his family had been implicated in the seven murders. On 18 July 2005, Milat's former lawyer, John Marston, who had been fired before the murder trial, made a deathbed statement, in which he claimed that Milat had been assisted by an unknown woman in the killings of the two British backpackers. On 7 September, 2005 his final appeal was refused. Ivan Milat is likely to remain in prison for the rest of his natural life, 